Hi, friend. How you doing today? How's it going? We are in oh, such a weird time, such, such a weird time. So I just wanted to check in, let you know that I'm thinking about you. And it might seem weird because you're like, me? Sarah doesn't even know who I am. But the collective you, I'm really, really thinking about how we can just take care of ourselves during this time. And I wanted to let you know that I'm sending love, energy, and light everybody's way. So welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. If this is your first time, you don't even know me. But my name is Sarah Bueno, and I'm your host. And this is a podcast where we talk about the intersectional journey of healing self while caring for others. If you are a person who's been listening for a while and you're like, how can I support the show? One thing you can do is go to Apple Podcast and rate and review the podcast. It really does help, just kind of gives the show some, some cred, street cred and, and visibility and anything that you're willing to do is just so appreciated by me. Now let's get on to the meat of it. Today's guest is somebody I'm excited to introduce you to, Anna Galladay. She thrives on curating creative, spiritual, and entrepreneurial possibility. As a highly accomplished and multi-talented creative, marketing and brand expert, she has over 20 years of blended corporate, independent, and not-for-profit experience. She's a minister in the United Methodist Church, and her ministry is focused on social justice and any inequality that exists both inside and outside the walls of the corporate church. She is diligent in her advocacy of full inclusion of all persons in the United Methodist denomination. As a queer justice advocate via faith and social construct arenas, she boldly enters spaces of difference and stands firmly in the gap. And she's got kick-ass hair. So without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Anna Galladay. Hi, Anna. Welcome to Conversations with a Wounded Healer. Hey, how are you? It's so nice to be here. I'm so thrilled. I am excited to first see your hair. Uh, wow. That was, <laughs> let's be honest, that was the most important thing to me today. <laughs> you know, there are things in my life that I am proud of, and there are things in my life that are just necessities. My yeah. hair is both. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well done keeping it so beautiful during quarantine. Thank you. <laughs> but anyway, more important things why we're more here. I'd love for you to start off telling listeners who you are and, and what you do. Yeah, thank you. I am a United Methodist pastor. I am reside in the heart of Southeast Tennessee in Chattanooga. I also am the co-director of the Activist Theology Project. I direct that with my partner, Robin Henderson Espinosa, and Robin is a trans, queer, Latinx, and I am a white, cis, straight woman, and we have a blast. We co-direct the organization, and we host a podcast with the same name called the Activist Theology Podcast. Mm -hmm. And you will be releasing more episodes, right? Because I was just yeah. looking today. Okay, good, good. There's a lot going on right now. So I imagine you've been a little busy. Yeah, no, actually, there's one hitting later today. So oh, yep. excellent. Yep. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah, well, I think I told you in the email, I actually grew up United Methodist. Yeah. So I, it's, yeah, there's a lot to talk about there. But how did you get to where you are, right? Because not every United Methodist decides I'm going to become a pastor and then I'm going to be an activist, right? So give us the rundown of how that happened for you. Yeah, so I was actually an activist first. I actually didn't kind of answer my call to ministry until much later in my life. Um, about mm. 10 years ago, I finally started listening to that nagging thing that a lot of us feel like we're getting from the divine saying, like, I'm telling you what I need you to do. And you're not listening. And hey, right. like, I'm gonna keep like bugging the crap out of you until you pay attention. Yeah, I was an activist before that, in a few different ways, mainly from the standpoint of queer liberation and, and equity. I went to art school when I was in undergrad. And so I'm, I'm 46 years old. And so I was in art school in the early nineties. And I met a few folks who were just at the point of coming out and it changed the trajectory of my understanding. I was very involved in the church, but I also was very committed to the labor that they were doing with their families and in the world to try to 
be accepted and work through this weird dynamic of coming out in the 90s in the heart of the AIDS epidemic. And it set me on a path kind of early on to say, you know what, not only is it not right what we're doing, but I didn't know the word privilege back then. I didn't, right. none of us kind of had this construct to identify right. what that looked like, but I knew I had the capacity to be someone whose voice could make a difference if I used it in the right way. And so I was doing that work off and on throughout the late nineties and into the early aughts. And all that while I am a United Methodist, but I'm not just a, I mean, I was a church leader really my entire life. I mean, I'm one of those kids that, I mean, I went to church every single Sunday as a kid. I was the president of my youth group. By the time I was old enough to serve on committees, I was serving on committees within my local congregation. I was chairing committees in my early 20s. Never thought that pastoral ministry was part of that path for me, but always knew that I was like the committee chair, leading things within my local community. And so all the while that I'm doing this work for queer inclusion, I'm also still a very kind of dedicated and consistent member of my local congregation. And I'm watching what's happening in the Mm -hmm. United Methodist Church. It was very ancillary for me in the 90s and the early aughts in that, you know, my congregation wasn't really talking about what was going on in the denomination. Mm -hmm. We weren't the kind of congregation that like gave reports to the congregation and said, like, this is what's happening in the international denomination. But that kind of thing became real evident to me when I relocated from Virginia at that time to Tennessee and actually planted or revitalized an existing congregation where we were doing a lot of interaction with our bishop. And we were doing a lot of interaction from a denominational level because we planted a church in the heart of Tennessee that from its very inception was open and affirming, was a congregation that said from the absolute onset in, you know, 2010, this is a place where not only should queer people feel safe, but they should feel as if they are welcomed into the full life of the ministry. Mm -hmm. And they're going to serve and they're going to lead and they're going to teach and they're going to preach. They're going to do all the things. And we had to work through the logistics of that with our bishop, who in many ways was not 100% supportive of, you know, the work we were trying to do. Yeah. And just side note, I'm sorry if I seem distracted. My dog all of a sudden is like, now she wants to move. And so I'm just like, don't, just don't pee. I have shit to do. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So the heart of this podcast is really about the healer. And I find it so fascinating and interesting, the spark that you had very early on that you you knew you had a voice that you needed to use for the good of people who didn't have that same voice. And I don't even know if you can talk about that spark. Like, why, like I feel similarly, and I, I don't know if I can name it. Yeah, and I don't even know if I even knew what it was back then. Now that I'm getting older and I, you know, I've been through the copious amounts of therapy that I've been through and I have done some pretty significant deep dives on how I've gotten to this place. A lot of the things that I've discovered about myself or remember about myself were just like things I did. They were just like I did things in the 90s because I had a gay roommate who was lucky that his parents didn't kick him out, but everybody else in his life, Mm. like walked away from him. I'm incapable in some ways of even verbalizing a spark other than the compassion Mm -hmm. that came with me saying, this doesn't sit well with me. And like deep in my soul, this just doesn't, this doesn't work. It doesn't feel good. And if it doesn't feel good for me as someone who's not going through it, I can't imagine what it feels like for him. And yet you take action, right? Because a lot of people may feel that, but they don't necessarily take action, which is part of what is was culminating right now as we're talking all the protests with George Floyd, right? I think finally, all of a sudden, white people, there's, there's a spark that, okay, I need to take action now. So just noting that, right, that that's very important. 
Yes. So, I mean, as you may know, I mean, I've been in the streets almost every night this week. We have a really beautiful community here in Chattanooga that, I mean, we have been peaceful for six nights in a row. Um, Mm. We've had only a handful of arrests and they weren't arrests that were violent in nature. Mm. We've got amazing people of color that are organizing this effort. And I'm really proud of the way that white folk are shutting up and mm-hmm. sitting down and standing back. You know, some of them are getting their feelings hurt in understanding the dynamic of what it means to be a follower in the movement right. and an ally and a support system versus leading the charge. Mm-hmm. But they're making my heart happy in ways that I didn't anticipate. Because I feel like for the last, you know, dozen years, I see the same people on the streets all the time. I mean, if we're out doing an action. I mean, we had President Trump come here. Well, he was candidate Trump come here three and a half years ago to campaign and at our huge sports arena. And I mean, it was a nightmare. And I mean, it was the same couple hundred of us out there that (laughs) that is always out there for everything else. You know, every- Hey, Fred. Hey, Susie. Yes, exactly. Every (laughs) trans bathroom bill fight, it's the same, you know, people, Mm -hmm. whether we're black or brown or indigenous or whatever we are. But to see this multi-thousand heart army of oh I love that of of young kids and and Mm. you know gen xers and boomers just like engaged in work that they didn't think they needed to worry about before it's just it's Mm. really been it's I am weary I am exhausted I am sure my body hurts like I'm not built for this shit, like this everyday <laughs> activist shit. I, I right. joke that I, like my head and my heart might be activists, but on weeks like this, they need to remind my fat butt that it also <laughs> needs to be an activist. And it's not, it's not as, as trained as my head and my heart are. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, so. Yes. I relate to that for sure. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Heart army. I just love the imagery and the energetic quality of that. That's just so beautiful. I want to bring to kind of, you know, the spiritual piece of this, because it's always been such a mystery to me how spiritual communities can decide like, you know, this behavior is good and this behavior is bad. (laughs) And somebody, oh, we're vocalizing over there. So if you hear a puppy, that's (laughs) whatever. Somebody brought up to me the other day that all of the things that the church essentially denounces are probably more likely in communities of color. So I'm just going to read it. And Sarah Hayes, this is you who said this. Let me find it because it was so good. And I'm curious what you have to say about it. So let's see. So she's from Tennessee as well. She's from Memphis. And she said, White Christians who love Trump are covert white savior racists. If everyone followed the rules of the church, they would all be pure and happy. I'll express what I believe. Their assumptions are not truths. People would be married and and have sex within marriage. If black people have sex and babies outside of marriage, that is more threatening. People would not do drugs. They think black people just do drugs. People would not steal and murder. They think people of color just the ones stealing and and murdering. Uh, They really do associate groups of people as being more full of sinful behaviors that they need to vehemently protect themselves from. Mm. Yeah, there's definitely an an understanding or an assumption within the evangelical, predominantly white evangelical church that their holiness supersedes yeah. all of the holiness of others. Right. And, you know, for any of us who are in pastoral ministry or really any kind of spiritual development work, I mean, that innate holiness is is a part of every being, regardless of action and assumption. It's interesting. I feel as if I've largely been shielded from the radical evangelical side of Christianity because I grew up in the United Methodist Church. And for many, many decades, the UMC was this like progressive little hub of, Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we were ordaining women in the late 1960s, much to the chagrin of tons of denominations. And we were seen as the denomination that kind of was breaking the rules, you know, and yet in the early 70s, we put the kibosh on queer inclusion and never looked back and have had 50 years of fighting to get the wholeness of people affirmed within Mm -hmm. our book of discipline. 
And so there's this weird, weird dichotomy for me, right? Because I'm a part of a denomination that has really stood in the gap in a lot of ways, except for that one place that I have found myself really feeling as if I can't stay quiet anymore. And I am seeing more and more of the bend to perfection or an assumption of perfection Mm. through my conservative UMC colleagues or more, I guess, conservative or biblically doctrinal Mm. colleagues who really just don't feel like there's any space for humanizing this conversation. And and it's, Mm. it's bothersome. It's, I just don't understand how a denomination that has done Mm -hmm. such good things for so long can be single handedly hurting and Mm -hmm. harming and killing the souls of a group of people who want so desperately to to love and follow Jesus. I mean, it just doesn't fit with me. Right. And my mom, she would say that her best friend was Jesus. And as I kind of grew up and like really kind of realized what was happening in our dynamic, Jesus kind of became a bad word for me and she's passed away. And since I've gotten space from that and and reconnected to spirituality in a way that feels authentic for me, somebody reminded me that your mom's Jesus is maybe not actually Jesus. Um, (laughs) You know, he was somebody different for her and hearing all sorts of faith leaders talk about, you know, Jesus being a mystic and Jesus being an activist, right? All of these things. And so it's, it's just so fascinating and mind boggling. Like you said, like, how do we get this disconnect? It's just, I can't, I don't even have words. Well, I mean, if you, if you know anything about the political dynamics and the political history over the last 40 years, this was actually constructed. I mean, we, as the Christian church, the white Christian church, allowed for the Republican Party to single-handedly co-opt Christianity. And they did so through a series of elections and and laws and appointments to the judicial branch. And then when Ronald Reagan came along, Hmm. they allowed things like the war on drugs to enhance their messaging around evangelicalism. And then when the AIDS epidemic came to us in a big, scary way, they allowed it to guide a message. And so, I mean, the political side of this conversation, to think that this has not been an actual constructed movement is to miss a large part of the point. Because there were many, many years really prior to the 1970s, where the Republican Party, the GOP may not have been on the side of justice, but they certainly weren't solely on the side of biblical inerrancy and believing that the construct that they had established for themselves was was against everyone else. This has been tangled and woven and really intentionally structured to give us the evangelical party that we have now in the, mm. in the Christian church. And I often remind people that, you know, lest we think that a separation between church and state is a valid thing, it absolutely is not and has never been. Right. It's a misnomer to think right. in any way, shape or form that the two aren't inextricably tied together. Yeah. Which is part of the reason of how we got here. Like right. we got here because there was a method to the way that this happened. And when you set it up to succeed and you have a political system that affords you the ability to have the voice box behind it, it's hard to take it down. Thank you so much for that education. I feel like, you know, I want to believe in the benevolence of all people. And yet these, yeah, I mean, you illustrated beautifully that this was intentional and that makes a difference. Sure. And carved into all that, right, Sarah, is, I mean, the prison industrial complex is a result of, among other things, the the rise of evangelicalism. Because Mm. evangelicalism gave rise to the war on drugs, The war on drugs Mm -hmm. gave rise to Three Strikes You're Out. Three Strikes You're Out gave rise to the prison industrial complex, which in every way was set up to harm black and brown men specifically. And so, I mean, it's like this foundation. They have been just building these blocks and building this tower 
of Babel for decades now. And really until, you know, some really smart voices started doing the work, the labor over kind of putting it in context and letting us all understand what was happening, many of us missed it. We missed that it was happening right under our own noses. Right. And it's, I'm sure, not an accident that you say the Tower of Babel. And that's kind of where we are right now, where things really, truly have to be destroyed in order to be rebuilt. Correct. Yeah. Well, I'd love to get your answer to the question about whether or not you consider yourself a healer. Mm. It's a very hard question for me, partially because the notion of healer for me commands an understanding of an ability that others see in me that I don't necessarily think I have. Hmm. I recognize that I have power in my words. I have power in my writing. I have power in my preaching. I have power in the work that I do in the world. And I know because I have been told that that power and, and the use of that power has healed the souls of others, has healed the hearts of people. I recognize that the labor that I've done in the United Methodist Church and, I mean, being fired from the denomination and, and literally being exited out the door because I stood up for queer people in my community, it was both harmful and healing from a standpoint of advocacy and allyship. And I don't ever want to be called an ally again. I want to be an accomplice. I want people to say, Anna was close enough to this work. Anna was close enough to those being harmed that she was hit with the stones that were being thrown at them before they were hit with those stones. Mm -hmm. If I'm an ally, I'm standing on the sidelines and I'm yelling, stop throwing stones at them. If I'm an accomplice, I'm standing in front of them. And so I recognize that my ability to be a healer comes with those decisions that I make. And yet there's a, I don't know if it's a humbleness or a hesitation to name myself as a healer. So I guess yes is the answer. <laughs> Although it makes me really uncomfortable to say it. Yeah, you can say fuck here. Yeah. We Thanks. love that word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's funny just, you know, having asked this question over a hundred times, it's, that's that is usually the hesitation is is not wanting to take responsibility for healing and and yeah, it just feels like there's a sacredness in that word. There's a sacredness in the act of healing. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I, I, I would love to be able to confidently say, yes, God, yes, I'm a healer. But I think more so that I am a reluctant healer or a healer once removed. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel about the term wounded healer? I think that that definitely resonates more with me. I also recognize that the term wounded healer feels very much like Jesus to me. Mm -hmm. Feels very much like a Christ-centered conversation. Mm -hmm. And and I'm a I'm you know unashamed about my love for Jesus and for any of your listeners who have heard Robin and I talk, you know Robin is largely agnostic and likes Jesus every once in a while and I <laughs> I am an unashamed, you know, follower mm -hmm. and really acknowledge that my capacity to follow a Palestinian brown Jew um, mm -hmm. has a lot to do with the reason that I'm so passionate about a lot of the other work that I that I do in the world. And so the concept of a wounded healer feels very Jesus like to me. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've had a couple other pastors on the show. And it's like I said before, kind of trying to change my relationship with Jesus because he didn't do anything to me that was bad. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do anything wrong. It's so funny that like I had come to terms with the word God a long time ago, but Jesus for some reason still kind of like there's a, it's a fear response truly. And it's, I think that's part of the, the trauma that I went through. You know, a lot of people have that. And sometimes it's the church itself. And sometimes it's a person who is practicing religion in a certain way. So I feel the way that you're talking about him and that like I can really connect to. 
That's really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really wish we could talk forever, but I know. I, I know I'm on a timeline today, but I, I mean, I'd love to have you back at some point too. And we can I'd love it. continue the discussion, but I just, I really appreciate your, your time and your energy and, and everything that you're doing on, on the front lines. Thank you. It's definitely a, a labor of love. And my goal is to be there, but be invisible. You know, I want to be there. I want to be a, as much of a support as I can. And, you know, I think there are times where we need to be in the streets and there are times where we need to be behind our keyboards or behind our mm -hmm. microphones. And mm -hmm. we're all just trying to figure our way through it and praying and hoping beyond hope that this hurt and anxiety that we feel in these moments are actual birth pains mm -hmm. that are about to mm -hmm. birth for us something new and beautiful that we haven't yet imagined or that we've imagined and have never, ever thought possible. Oof. I just wanted to let that one breathe. <laughs> Thank you. Would you tell folks where they can find you? Absolutely. You can listen to my podcast, the Activist Theology Podcast, anywhere that you listen to your podcasts. We're on all of the networks. You can find the project itself at Activist Theology. Don't forget that activist and theology share a T. So the T in the middle yes. is shared. Uh, if you want to follow me personally, I am on all of the socials at Unholy Heretic, and that's Unholy H A I R a tick. <laughs> and yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to chat. I'd love to catch up and commune and figure out how we change the world and how we become accomplices in the work together. Wonderful. And I also feel like we could be sisters. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like looking at your face. Looking at mine, looking at your face. Yeah, there's a lot of similarities. <laughs> Our nose rings on the opposite side, but yes, that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> we could deal with it. Right. And it's so our, our parents could tell us apart. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Well, again, I just, I really appreciate you and your, and your time and your enthusiasm and, and everything. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. If you want to learn more about Anna, do make sure that you go to the Activist Theology podcast. And you probably already heard our episode with Robin Henderson Espinoza. You will find it super delightful. So you can also find more information about Anna at our website at www.headhearttherapy.com slash podcast. Thank you to the Creative Imposter Studios for editing, to Liam O'Donnell for the album art, and to Ben Mueller for our theme music. Until next time, take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.